Well, next, a Climate Watch conversation with the European Union Commissioner for Climate Action. Connie Hedegaard is working with EU members to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to develop an international carbon trading market. The commissioner was in California this week to meet with state officials and local business leaders. Climate Watch senior editor Craig Miller spoke with her. Commissioner Hedegaard, thanks for working us into your schedule, which I imagine is pretty tight. Thank you for having me. Um, you have met this week with Governor Brown and Mary Nichols, the head of the state's uh, Air Resources Board. What was the purpose and substance of those conversations? Well, the reason why I'm here is that California is one of the states that are actually moving forward in the United States. And in Europe, trying we know, to. trying to, and we know that uh, in Europe, that when sometimes when, when California starts to, to do something, then it's the start of what will end up being the American way of doing things. So that is, of course, why it's interesting to, to listen to the governor and Mary Nichols. What are they planning? What are they doing? But also to see if there are areas where we can cooperate. I wanted to come back to uh, California's leadership on this in a minute. But first, I want to talk about the, the present nuclear situation. Um, the European Union has almost 150 reactors, which produce, if my math is correct, about 30 percent of the electricity, right, for the 27 countries. Um, right after the incident in Japan occurred and since, there's been polling done showing a shift in attitudes in Europe, uh, an area that depends heavily on nuclear power. Uh, I suppose a certain amount of this is natural, uh, a shift in attitude away from support for nuclear power. Do you think this is transitory or do you think this is a more permanent thing? Basically, I think it will be very different in different member states in Europe because the tradition and the discussion over nuclear is so different. Personally, I come from a country, Denmark, where we never had nuclear. Right. Others would have had it for a long time, France, for instance. And the matter of the fact is we have 143 nuclear power plants in Europe, and they are not going to, to sort of going away anytime soon. So what we did from the European Commission was immediately to say that we should have a stress test of all of these 143 plants so that we now test the security. And um, I think that as politicians, we also have a responsibility not to sort of make people panic now. I mean, it was a very, very extraordinary event happening in Japan. It's not that likely that it happens, but of course, security will have to be at its, its maximum. Having said that, then it's clear that sort of the tailwind for nuclear that we started to see even in countries that normally would never have had nuclear in Europe, that is gone. That is the political reality as I see it. And you're counting on nuclear to help uh, keep carbon emissions down in Europe, right? Because, uh, you know, in, in the European Commission, we have sort of just calculated what are the plans of each member state, because the energy mix is totally up to each state itself. So in that sense, yes, uh, nuclear is part of the equation. But for instance, now in Germany, they will have a big discussion. OK, if we are shutting down some of the nuclear plants, what would replace it? Should we just go back to coal? Should we have sort of natural gas as a bridging technology? Or, as many would argue in Germany, should they then focus even more on renewable renewables and on energy efficiency. You know, we always talk about different energy components, energy sources, but maybe the biggest source we have that is just to save more energy, to use the energy much more efficient. There is a huge potential even in Europe where we have been addressing this for decades. Meanwhile, here in California, we're moving ahead or trying to with a, a cap and trade program for, for emissions reductions. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been a a process laden with speed bumps. Uh, and it's been said that we have a, a great advantage in being able to learn from the mistakes that the European Union has made in a program that you've had in place for about five years now, which I've read recently has really only reduced emissions by less than 1% so far. Do you count that as a success? Yes, I do. And uh, I do not know where these figures come from. I just know that where American emissions from 1990 to 2009 continued to increase, in Europe they actually decreased with 16% in the same period. So we must do something right. This is before the recession. You're that looking is at before, them. no, that is including the recession. We just had the figures from 2010, okay. and then it is 13, 14% that we have actually reduced to compared to, 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 to 1990, mm -hmm. where you have increased in the same period in, in the US. So we're doing something right. But of course, when you are building a very complex system like that, those who do it first 
in the first couple of years, of course, have a lot of lessons learned. Uh, and in that sense, it's true that we took the burden of developing the system. Now we have the experiences there and it's much more easy for those to follow. We would know what works and where should you be careful. OK, what's the biggest lesson for California in all of this? I don't know that's up to California, but I think that one of the lessons we learned was it's very, very crucial to be strong in the sense that do not give out too many allowances for free. That is the biggest sort of temptation here because, of course, industry would like to have a lot of allowances for free. Sure. Definitely. Uh, and there in the first period, uh, Europe gave out too many allowances for free. That was one of the lessons learned. In other words, industry would rather not have to pay for the permission to put carbon into the air, they would like to be able to... They'd I mean, like to it's fair enough. Sure. They are business. Right. They want to uh, be right. able to emit as cheap as possible. But the whole idea in this system is that it is not just a tax. That is the difference for just having a tax. The, the advantage of a cap and trade system is that you also cap emissions. So you make it attractive to emit less. You make an incentive for those who are very energy efficient. It pays off to be very energy efficient, whereas it is very expensive to be very inefficient. That is the whole idea behind this system. Does it make sense, though, for California to go it alone when we were at present in the, this thing called the Western Climate Initiative, which is supposed to be a regional trade? You know, nominally New Mexico is with us, but probably not for long, leaving us with just a few Canadian provinces, many of which aren't even in the West. What, does that make sense for California to try to? You know, that's up to the Californians to, de to decide. But basically, uh, you are the seventh or the eighth largest economy in the world. Uh, right now, New Zealand is establishing this. Korea is uh, planning to do this from 2014. Even China, I think that will come as a surprise to many American viewers. China, in their last five-year plan, has now said it's not enough just to set a, a carbon target. You must also use the market mechanism. So they are actually now in five provinces and three big cities. There they are making grand scale pilot projects on cap and trade. Isn't it interesting that China is using the market mechanisms in this field before the American administration is doing that? Yes, very interesting and very troubling to a lot of people. Commissioner, thanks very much for giving us some time. Have a safe trip back. Thank you for having me. Thank you.